Down here we get the privilege of offering a sacrifice of praise. The Bible says, bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. You say, well, why is it a sacrifice? Well, because you might have had a bad day. You might have had a rough week. You might have had a rough life. <laughs> and praising God when you, don't feeling, when you don't feel like it is often a sacrifice. It's like, I'm going to worship you because... I believe by faith, not by feelings, that you're worthy. But let me tell you something. Nobody will bring a sacrifice of praise in heaven. Down here, we have the privilege of bringing a sacrifice of praise. Up there, we will have the pleasure of worshiping God. The pleasure. And the most reserved among you will dance like lunatics up there. <laughs> The most reserved and calm among you will be utterly set free and ecstatic. And you will be worshiping the Lord as passionately, as vigorously as you can. And it won't be too much. It won't be more than he's worthy of. God won't be like, hey, slow down. Come on, I'm not really that great. <laughs> no. It's going to be amazing. But we thank God for the privilege of bringing a sacrifice of praise while we're here. You guys ready for some meat tonight? Good. We're going to get into the word tonight. We're going to really get into the word. So let's just pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you in Jesus' name for your presence in this place. And we bless what you're doing in our lives and in the lives of all those that you have brought in here. Bless our brother who just left somewhat upset. <laughs> Lord, just have mercy on him. Just bring joy to his heart, bring forgiveness from him towards any who have hurt him, and forgive him, Father, in any way that he has committed sin before you, Lord God. Don't even know his name, but you know his name, so we bless him. We plead the blood of Jesus over him. And Lord, I just take authority over any and every spirit that would seek to distract, distract or disrupt the ability of people here to listen and hear the truth and hear the word that sets us free, God. We thank you for your angels in this place. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. I thank you for your anointing upon me to rightly divide the word of truth, Lord, to, to speak what your word says clearly. In Jesus' precious and mighty name. And y'all said, Amen. 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 All right. Let's turn. Let's go to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. Pray for my cell phone that the battery would last. <laughs> I've been on it a little bit there. Genesis chapter 3. You know, in Kings, there's a story about, I believe it's, I believe it's Elisha. And um, it's either Elijah or Elisha. I'm pretty sure it's Elisha. And, and in the story, there's a company of prophets that he sort of has a responsibility over, and he's mentoring these guys. And, and they're, you know, one of them's chopping some wood, chopping at a tree, and the axe head flies off and falls into a nearby stream. And he comes to Elisha and says, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Like, oh, I mean, iron was not as easy to come by then as it is today. <laughs> and an axe head was a precious thing. When I was growing up in Papua New Guinea, um, we were in a, in a tribe there with a bunch of... Uh, really Stone Age people, and they had stone axes. And they would take those axes, and they would chop at a tree, and they would very quickly become dull. And then they would take the head, and they would take another stone, and they would grind it on that one to try and get it sharp. And they would grind it for, for days or weeks to try and get it sharp enough to use. And then they would strap it back to their, their, you know, their stick, and then they would hack away at the tree a bit more. And after a little while, it would be dull again. And some of these men would literally cry over the hardship of having to try and sharpen this stone. And we have, we have uh, all sorts of chainsaws and cutting implements. But this guy lost his axe head. And he said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. Oh, I am in so much doo-doo. And so Elisha went over to the stream and he said, show me where it fell. Well, in the stream. Yeah, I know in the stream. Whereabouts in the stream? Well, over here. So they went to where the axe head fell. And then he took, took a piece of a branch from a tree and he 
skinned it, and he threw it in the water, and then the axe head floated, which is a miracle, obviously, right? Iron doesn't float. And he said, reach forth your hand and take it. Well, there's a principle there that when something is lost, go back to where it fell. Well, our innocence was lost. In Genesis chapter 3, we read verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Actually, he didn't say you would die if you touched it. So right there, that's kind of where, you know, my kids used to do that too. You know, they'd be like, they'd want to watch a movie or something, and I'd be like, no, we can't watch that movie. Never? (laughs) That's not what I said. (laughs) It's like, always go to the nth degree, right? (laughs) Nick's like, that was me. I know it was me. (laughs) You know, they always want to, oh, you're making a rule, so then I'm going to add to the rule. Beware of adding to God's rules. End up in religion. But in any case, she did say we're not supposed to eat of it. Um, and or will die. And Satan responds, you will not surely die. <laughs> the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye <coughs> and also, bo- also desirable for gaining wisdom, I'm reading out of the NIV, but I'm just going to switch over here mid-verse to the New King James. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. You know, the Lord created the earth, and he made all the animals and and the seas and the fish and the birds and all that stuff. And then he made man and he said, it is good. And then Adam was naming all the animals and there was not a helper found for Adam, not a help meet, a kindred spirit. And the Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone. He caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. He took a rib and he made Eve. And he brought Eve to Adam when Adam woke up. And Adam said, this shall be Eve or she was flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, and she was taken from man. And then the Lord looked and he said, it is very good. So the perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful God created a universe, and he created two human beings, and he said, it is very good. Scripture says that God would come and walk with Adam, and by inference Eve as well, he would walk with them in the garden in the cool of the day. They had unlimited, intimate, visual contact with the creator of the universe who would walk with them every day and talk with them about what had been created. And Satan came along and he said, I know God said it's very good, but it could be better. You're missing something. You don't actually have what you really need in order to be happy. You're actually not very smart. Oh, really? I'm God's perfect creation, fellowshipping with him on a regular basis, and yet you're telling me that I'm not smart. Who got kicked out of heaven? (laughs) But she believed him. She believed the lie. She looked at the fruit and she said it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. There's no greater wisdom than obedience. There's no greater wisdom than obedience. We think we're going to be wise. We're going to pursue all sorts of things. The Bible says don't even study evil. You should be ignorant concerning evil and wise concerning what is good. 
but she allowed Satan to introduce the consciousness of lack into her perfect environment. You don't have what you need right now in order to manifest the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. I got everything I need. You know what? Right now at this moment, I have everything I need. And so do you. You have everything that you need. Now, there might be th- some areas in your life that, you're, that you perceive could be better. And that might even be true. But you have everything that you need right now in order to manifest the kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. God has not, from the moment that you accepted Christ, ordained a day in which he has not given you grace to be free from the consciousness of lack. The perception that I don't have what I need right now in order to be happy. Something comes in and distorts our mind and convinces us that we can't actually trust him with our desires for pleasure. Either him or his representatives. You are his representatives. I can't trust God because I see flaws in Daniel, and those flaws cause me to lose frustration or lose patience, and I can't manifest the kingdom because I'm surrounded by so many imperfect people. Or maybe I can't manifest the kingdom because I'm so imperfect. And both of those are lies. Both of those are lies. So, Eve took, she ate, gave to her husband, he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. (laughs) Oh, great, you're dumb and you need to become smart. Here, eat this. Oh, oh, that's not exactly the, the kind of wisdom I was hoping to gain. I want to show you something you don't know. You're naked. Dang, I was kind of hoping for, I don't know, computer smarts or something. <laughs> that's, that's not information that's helpful. It's not benefiting me. You're right, there was something I didn't know, but now that I know it, I'm not better off. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I need you guys to just zone in and really focus and go deep with me because there's an amazing truth here for some of you tonight. Well, for all of you, um, for the hungry tonight that I believe will set you free. Where the enemy has had you bound, this will set you free. It will propel you light years forward in your walk with God if you can get this revelation tonight. So they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And it says, Adam and his wife hid themselves. It doesn't say they heard a thunderbolt from heaven. What have you done? God came to walk in the garden with Adam just like he had every other day. Why? Because he didn't know what they'd done? He's omniscient. He knows everything. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? So Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And the Lord said, that's right, you're naked. Can't believe you never asked me for clothes before. Didn't you know you were naked? No, the Lord says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Listen, verse 12. Then the man said, here's his second sin. And I wonder, I just wonder what would have happened differently if he hadn't committed this sin. Adam said, The woman that you gave me, I'm blaming her and I'm blaming you. This pile of stinking doo-doo on the floor, that's not mine. That's hers and yours. The woman you gave me, 
She gave me the fruit. Uh, twisted my arm and uh, just had to take a bite. It's not my fault. And the Lord God said to the woman, Now is God, is God uh, grilling them to, truly, to really try and find out what really happened? Or is God giving them an opportunity? Is God giving them an opportunity to maybe respond differently? And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? What is this you have done? Not what did Adam do? What have you done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Nobody owns up. I wonder what would have happened if when they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, they had both run to him and thrown themselves on their faces and said, Father, we have sinned. Look at us. Oh, God, we have disobeyed you. And Eve said, I took it first. And Adam said, no, I'm the man. I should have protected her. Where was I when Satan was speaking to her? I, God, it's me. Please don't lay this sin to her charge. And Eve said, no, it's me. Don't, please don't blame Adam. I wonder if the response would have been different. Hmm. The consciousness of lack and the blame game. Turn to Hebrews 10, verse 22. Hebrews 10, verse 22. In fact, we can go back to 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, everybody say boldness, you know why the priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year with the blood from the animal to sprinkle on the mercy seat? Do you know why he would go in there to do that? To make atonement for himself and all the people. He came into the Holy of Holies because he needed forgiveness. Because he wasn't perfect. And so he would come into the Holy of Holies bringing the blood. And if he didn't have the blood... Then he was a dead man, and they tied a rope around their, their, their leg, and, and they, or they had a bell on it. And if he stopped moving, they would go, oh, I guess he had unconfessed sin, and they would pull him out. And it says that here in, here in Hebrews 10, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. When? Whenever you've sinned. Well, when I've sinned, I don't come boldly. That's a problem. Please don't confess that like some sort of false modesty. That when I've sinned, I come crawling and slithering into the holy of, oh, I'm a worm. The Bible says that we're to come boldly. Now, not arrogantly, but confidently expecting forgiveness. By a new and living way which he, Christ, consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. Adam and Eve, your hearts were not true in the day of your sin. And when God came, there was no humility and no remorse. There was just guilt. And he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Not in your righteousness, but in his. In the in the satisfaction and the sufficiency of the blood of Christ to cleanse you from all sin. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. But I want you to notice in verse 22, it says, With a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Let's, let's look at another verse that really helps us to understand it as well. Um, we'll go to, uh, well, we'll stay in Hebrews for one more verse. Hebrews 9, verse 13. So just go back a chapter. 
Hebrews 9, verse, uh, actually I'm going to start in 11. Hebrews 9, 11, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. <coughs> for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot, cleanse your conscience. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're needing to understand something here. Let's look at Colossians 1 verse 19. Stay with me. Stay focused, Daniel son. Verse 19. For it pleased, Colossians 1 verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him, in Christ, all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood, through the blood, through the blood of his cross, and you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Do you see, God came to walk with Adam and Eve, but they hid themselves. When they sinned, it wasn't like God disappeared off the map, and all of a sudden, it's like, God didn't come today. And next day, God, God hasn't been here all week. Where's God? I guess, I guess we're so wicked and so unholy that he, he can't even come near us anymore. He knew what they had done, but he came prepared to walk with them in the garden the same, and they hid themselves. And when he confronted them, they blamed one another. Because they were alienated and enemies in their minds by wicked works. They were alienated and enemies in their minds by the wicked works. We're going to get some revelation of how powerful the blood is and how powerful the love of God is. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians. Actually, first go, to, sorry, first go to Romans 2, and then we'll go to 2 Corinthians. Romans 2. <coughs> Romans 2, verse 12. Paul is writing to the Romans and he's talking about he's talking about the law and he's talking about um, sin and those having the law and those not having the law. And he says in verse 12, for as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, meaning the Gentiles, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing, now even defending them. Now the translations say, or ex also excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Even those who don't have the law, have the law. They don't have the Levitical law, but inside. And even though they don't have that law, when they do what is right, their hearts bear witness that they have done what is right. And when they don't obey the Levitical law, or when they don't obey the understanding of those who have the Judeo-Christian ethic, guess what? Scripture says that, that without the law, there is no transgression. That's what it says in the word. Without the law, there's no transgression. So when someone does something, but they didn't know that it was at all wrong, and they weren't given any opportunity to become acquainted with the fact that it was wrong, God doesn't hold them accountable. But when they know the law, and at some point, the, wor the word is saying that they all know the law. It says even, even the Gentiles, who by nature not having the law, when they obey the law, it testifies within their hearts. And their thoughts are sometimes condemning them. Even though they don't have the law of God, they know that's wrong what I just did. 
and I don't need anybody in my culture to tell me I shouldn't have done that. I know that's wrong, and I feel guilty. And at other times, when they do what is right, their thoughts, their own thoughts defend them. So when we come before the throne of God, the greatest impediment to the progression of your spiritual life is how you perceive yourself. Do you see yourself as forgiven? Because it's the alienation in your mind by the wicked things that you have done that is the real problem. That's why it says, don't lose your hope. It says, cast not away your confidence, which has great potential for reward. Great recompense of reward. Do you know that your confidence in the finished work of the cross and in Christ's work is actually what saves you? It's your confidence... That you are forgiven. That he is faithful. That he's, he who's begun a good work in you will complete it. And when you begin to start losing confidence in that thing, I actually, actually, I'm, I'm, it's such a narrow road. And you know what? There's two ditches. I'm going to grab a couple of props here. This is, this is how narrow the road is. Pretty much wide enough. This is how narrow the road is. And you can only walk it by faith and through the grace of God. But the grace of God is to overcome. And so here's, the, here's, here's what these, these ditches or these boundaries represent. On the one side, it's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. That's not really sin. That's on the one side. And on the other side, I'm a loser. I'll never be able to do this. Oh, it's too hard. I'm worthless. I should just kill myself now. Oh, nobody loves me. Oh, God doesn't even really love me. That is also sin. That narrow road says, yes, I did it. I own it. I did it. I can't blame anyone. I don't want to blame anyone. I want to own this. Because if I own this, I can take it to God. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Satan will keep trying to push you off one side or push you off the other. This side is, it's not my fault. Or it's not even sin. Or it's someone else's fault. Or that's not fair. Or God's not just. Or 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 or. That person betrayed me. That spouse betrayed me. I was bullied. I'm a victim. God's not fair. That church hurt me. That leader, that pastor is a focus on other people. And there is no peace that way. There is no peace. I made a mistake along with some other people, some close friends of mine, in the last 10 years. And my mistake hurt a lot of people. And I'm not saying I made the... the, the mistake alone, but I definitely made it, and I own it. And other people made mistakes around me at the same time that that was happening, and one person in particular made a really big boo-boo, and I was really mad at him, and my focus was on him for quite a while. I can't believe that you would do this. And it took God about two and a half to three years for me to kind of finally come to the conclusion that I was not a victim, but I had the opportunity to be a repentant culprit. If I would own up and stop saying, you know, that whole victim thing, it feels good in the sense of, well, it's not my fault. But it's lousy in the sense of my life is out of control. I'm at the mercy of all of these other flawed human beings around me and flawed systems and, 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 and flawed government. Because, you know, I mean, look what's going on in the States and look what's going on in Canada. And what about the church? Those leaders are, are, are mean. They're, they're, they're either too hard or too soft or, or too lazy or they're falling into sin or, or, or they just don't care or, they, or they're control freaks. And all of this, it's other people. And and as long as you stay a victim looking at everybody else and going, everybody's hurting me. That's a pretty powerless place to be. But if you'll own it and go, from the moment I accepted Christ, 
God has never ordained one day when I would not have all the grace necessary and maybe just as much as I'm, maybe I'll need all of it, but all the grace in order to manifest the kingdom, which is the absence of the consciousness of lack. The absence of the perception, I don't have what I need right now. And Satan's going, you need that. You need this. You need to talk about this person because they hurt you. And it'll make you feel better to gossip about them. You need that girl over there. You need that guy over there. You need that drug. You need that drink. You need that toke. You need that. You need to watch this movie. And I know it's got the Lord's name in vain in it, but you're bored. And so you need to watch this movie. Come on, you don't have what you need right now in order to be happy. So you need to reach out and take what God has not provided for you because you can't trust him with your desires for pleasure. The consciousness of lack is the root of all evil. And some say, no, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, but what do we think we can do with money? Buy what we think we need in order to be happy. Right? I'm going to use money to buy what I need in order to be happy. And God says, you have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Will you believe it? Will you believe it? When he says, I have given you all things that pertain to life and godliness... Christ in you, the hope of glory. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And then we got to start asking the question, who's talking me out of believing his word? Is it the people around me? Is it my own eyes? I mean, look at Paul and Silas in prison after having been beaten for preaching the word, casting the devil out of the soothsaying woman. And now they're in prison, hurting in stocks in the inner room, feces, rats, pain. And they're in there and they're conscious of no lack. And they're worshiping and praising God. So what you got going on that tops that? Hmm? Nothing. None of us do. None of us can look at what Paul and Silas were going through and go, I've got a reason to bellyache or to complain. And let me tell you something. When heaven looks down and sees that you have the same revelation concerning your state that God does, which is I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness, and even the pain that you're experiencing right now is actually achieving for you eternal reward, strengthening your faith, and about to result in household salvation for this city. Then heaven sees you praising and worshiping him, and God goes, I'm going down there, and break apart the prison. And even then, they didn't leave. Why? Because they were conscious of no lack. They were like, what, what, you think I was scared of being in here? You can kill me. And I didn't suffer all of this as soon as the doors opened to go, let's get out of here. I came here for something. I came here to see God's kingdom advance. And the jailer was going to kill himself. And Paul said, hey, hey, we're all here. And he's like, I just undid him. And he came running and he fell down. And he says, I thought I was the one with the key. But you have the key. Set me, set me free. Set me free. Hallelujah. A couple more verses here. A couple more verses here. Second uh, Corinthians 6. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, O oh, Corinthians, verse 11, O oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. I joke with my, with my family, with my boys and stuff, and some of you probably heard me joke about this before, but just because I did a lot of traveling growing up, I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of food. And there's just about nothing that I can't eat other than organs. I'm not big on organs, okay? I don't like brain. I don't like tongue. I don't like, you know, stomach and, you know, yeah, liver. I'm not big on that stuff. But there's lots of different foods that, yeah, I can try. I can, I can eat and drink many, many different things. I think China would probably test me because they eat really weird stuff. <laughs> but... um I would always tell my kids, I'm like, guys, this is freedom. Like, if you're a picky eater, you're actually bound. You are bound up. Because I can go almost anywhere and be happy eating whatever they put in front of me. Not be like, oh, 
I, don't, I, I can't eat that. I'm just like, I, I can eat it. Great. Which means I'm free. And that's what he says. He says, you're not restricted by us. If you look at what he's talking about before that, he's talking about, um, he's talking about the cross. He's talking about the gospel. He's like in verse 5 of, of 2 Corinthians, he says, In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by Holy Spirit, sincere love, by the word of truth, the power of God, by the arm of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left, by honor, dishonor, evil report, good report, deceivers, and yet true, as known and yet well, as unknown, yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things Paul's like I'm rich it doesn't matter what's going on around me in my environment I'm free and I'm trying to lead you follow me as I follow Christ I'm trying to lead you into true freedom and he says you are not restricted by us we're not putting unreasonable expectations on you what's restricting you are your own affections your own affections, your own expectations of what you think you have to have in order to be happy. Those are binding you. You think it's free to, I'm free. You're free to obey. You've been set free from the bondage of sin and the lust that is in the world, the corruption that is in the world through lust. You've been set free from that to be able to obey God and go, I don't care. You know what? I'm not living for now. I'm living in the now, but I'm living for heaven. And so I'm free. Do I need to stay up all night and pray? I'm free. Do I need to fast? I'm free. Should I eat? I'm free to eat. Should I eat a big bunch of meal and whatever they put in front of me? I'm free. God wants us all to be free. But they were, they were restricted by their affections. Let's keep going a bit farther. Now in return for the same, I speak to his children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord or agreement has Christ with Belial or Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? You should be a friend of sinners, but there's a big difference between a, being a friend of sinners, which means you come alongside them when, you're hurt, when they're hurting. You take them out for coffee, take them out for breakfast, spend some time with them, pour in the truth. There's a big difference between that and you hanging out with them doing what they think is fun, which a lot of the times is wrong. Not all the time. Validate their passions, but not their perversions. Spend time with them doing what's wholesome, but not what is unholy. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, what fellowship has light with darkness? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, verse 16. As God has said, I will dwell in them <coughs> and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Wow, what a promise. God says, come apart from the world. Stop watching the crap they watch because you're bored. Really. Stop watching. Stop, go stop going into their temples to watch the godless stuff that they watch. If they, put a, if they put a wholesome, edifying movie, go support it. But you shouldn't be in there watching nonsense that, that comes against the revelation of Jesus Christ, that comes against godliness. You shouldn't be watching that because you're bored. You're having fellowship with idols. And the Bible says, come apart from them, be separate. But how can you be separate? You can be separate when you're free from the consciousness of lack. So when Satan comes like he did to Eve and says, you don't have what you need in order to be happy, you can say, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I have the joy, 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 joy way down inside or however that goes. <laughs> down in my heart. I have the joy deep down in my heart. And you know what? It's not based on my exterior. It's all about my interior. 
It's about Christ in me, the hope of glory. And all I have to do, no matter whether I'm hungry, cold, tired, or whatever, all I have to do is just start thinking, this is temporary. This is coming to pass. It's not coming to stay. I'm destined for heaven. I'm going to dance on the streets of gold. My Father loves me. My Father died for me. My Father made provision for my forgiveness no matter what I have done. So I'm going to come boldly before his throne of grace. Some of you have not forgiven yourselves, and you think it's modesty or humility, but it's unbelief. Some of you have not forgiven yourself, and God does not consider that noble. You must forgive yourself. You must forgive yourself. When I screwed up really big, I was mad. I tried to blame this other person, and God showed me, you're not a victim. You're a culprit. Okay. And then I looked around at other people, and there was just, you know, I don't know. I've just been doing this too long. I knew I couldn't blame other people. I wanted to be mad at God, but I knew that didn't work out real well for Job. And I was just like, (laughs) you know, fine. I'm going to be mad at somebody. And uh, fine, if I'm the culprit, I'm going to be mad at me. I'm so mad at me. I'm so mad that I screwed things up so bad, and I hurt myself, and I hurt other people, and and it's unforgivable, and I'm mad. I'm going to punish myself for for a long time. And And the fear of the Lord came upon me. And he says, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven, and that includes yourself. Forgive yourself. And stop rehearsing either others' past mistakes or your own. Remember no more the former things. That's the beauty of today. Grace is not the requiring of perfection as a condition of progress. Grace is simply the provision of another opportunity and the encouragement and the empowerment to keep moving forward. I have no past. I've got a testimony, but i got no past. I'm not going to excuse myself on the basis of past victories or accuse myself on the basis of past failures. I have no past. I just have a testimony of the faithfulness of God. And here I stand today by his grace, breathing by his grace, heart beating by his grace. And I come boldly before his throne of grace saying, Lord, Lord, here I am, one of your sons. That you saved. And God, you and I both know, (laughs) I got a ways to go. But Lord, here I am again. And I have full expectation. I'm not going to hide when you come looking to walk in the garden in the cool of the day. I'm not hiding behind a tree going, I'm naked. No, I'm clothed in the righteousness of God. Not because I feel good. Not because I have a whole long track record of doing things perfectly. But every single day I need the blood of Christ. Every single day I need the forgiveness of God. And I fully expect to receive it. I fully expect to receive it. And I don't think that I can even talk to you because, well, I've been perfect for a long time. I make mistakes all the time. They're not necessarily the big mistakes. I shouldn't even call them big mistakes. Mistakes are mistakes, but they're not necessarily the mistakes that some of you have struggled with. I'm not struggling with, you know, um, looking at porn. I'm not struggling with, um, you know, substance abuse or anything like that. But the things that I struggle with are no less a grievance to God than any of those things. In fact, in some ways, they might be even more because I should know better. But my conscience will no longer be evil. I receive innocence. God wants to give those here who believe innocence. He wants to give you innocence tonight. He wants to give you his righteousness. It doesn't matter what you've done wrong. Do you believe that he's able to finish what he started? Will you receive his grace tonight and will you move forward? You know, one of my spiritual fathers and the man who ordained me, he said, self-pity is the canopy that we erect over the fungus and the mushrooms of our hurts to keep them alive and growing. Listen to that. Self-pity is this canopy, this shade that we erect over the mold and the fungus and the mushrooms which need the dark in order to properly grow. 
They don't grow well in sunlight. And self-pity. Either other people have hurt me or I'm a loser and I'm never going to get this right. The problem there is all your focus is, is on others and on yourself instead of on God. We need to tear away the canopy of self-pity. And we need to lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence comes our help. And we need to trust that the blood of Jesus is enough. It's enough, it's enough to forgive me. And the power of his Holy Spirit is enough to sanctify my affections. The blood is for your past sins. Many people talk and they say the blood of Jesus is for your, your, your sins, past, present, and future. And I know that, that if you commit sin, if, not when, but if you commit sin in the future, that the blood of Jesus, when you get there and have committed the sin and look backwards, it will be your past. And that when you repent, the blood will cover it. But the blood is not for your future. And the reason is, is because if you say the blood of Jesus is for my future sin, you're planning to sin. And that, that's not faith. God is not scripting sin into any of our lives from this moment forth. There is no sin scripted into your future. Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't say when you sin. He says, if we sin, we have an ad advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. No, there's another provision that has been made for your future. The blood of Jesus is for the remission of sins that are past, the word says. But the sanctification process is by the Holy Spirit through the word. Sanctify them, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. By the renewing of the mind through the washing of the water of the word. And the blood of Jesus deals with our past evil actions. And the power of the Holy Spirit, breathing on his word, deals with our present evil desires. Desire itself is not sin. It's a temptation. And the Lord wants to sanctify us. He wants to sanctify our affections and say, I've given you everything you need to make it through today. I've given you what you need to be happy. You don't have enough money to pay your rent. Trust me anyway. Paul says, if I have food and clothing, I should be content. You're being tempted in an area. I promise you, no temptation has seized you except that which is common to all men. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will make a way out so that you can stand up under it. For God tempts no man, nor can he be tempted. So there's no situation we get into where we have to say, God, you haven't given me what I need in order to manifest your kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy. So I'm going to have to take something you haven't provided. I'm going to have to steal. I'm going to have to cheat. I'm going to have to lie. I'm going to have to uh, uh, cheat around, look at porn, masturbate, smoke, shoot up, drink up, gossip, slander, blame others, be lazy, whatever. Nothing. God has not scripted any of that into your future. He scripted grace upon grace, kindness upon kindness, mercy and the blood of Jesus constantly on the mercy seat in heaven. And you can come boldly into that place saying, God, I receive my innocence again. Like a, oh, just like a big bucket just poured over me, washing away all stain. And we can go skipping from the first. <laughs> like little children. Used to discipline, discipline my kids. I say, you're not supposed to do that. Whack. I love you. Come here. Listen. Okay, go play. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and then playing. Is that we, we become adults and we get older, and then I can't believe I got a spanking. It's just not fair. I'm such a loser. Or, or, the, or, or you're wrong for spanking me. Just get over it and move on. Just get over yourself and move on. Get over your bad self and get on with your good self. Which is the new self created in Christ Jesus, which is being transformed into the image of the creator. Day to day, let's stand to our feet. Lord God, I thank you for innocence. Lord, we are here as your children, having had our innocence restored by the blood of Jesus. Not the blood of bulls and goats, Lord, which could not forever cleanse or make righteous those who continually offered them, O oh God. But we have been cleansed with the precious blood of a lamb without spot, without blemish, who is your son. 
And God, we receive grace today. God, I receive grace today. I receive forgiveness today. I receive mercy today because I'm your son, Lord. And I thank you for washing me and saving me. And Lord, though I stumble and though I fall, yet you pick us up. You give us another heartbeat, another breath in our lungs, God. Go ahead, Misha. Oh, thank you, God. If you're here tonight and the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, has been coming to you and accusing you and saying you're never going to make it. How can, he can't love you. It's not based on our righteousness. He loved us while we were yet sinners. And he loves us all along the journey and the path toward Christ's likeness. And we will not turn aside from that path and say it's too hard. We will not dumb down the requirements and say that we can live in sin, that we can be part of the world and, and be part of heaven at the same time. And neither will we say that, that, that we are losers and, and his blood isn't strong enough to cleanse us. His salvation isn't, isn't powerful enough to reach us. Your word, God, says that your arm is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is your ear heavy, that it cannot hear. So, Father, we come. And we say, wash us again in your blood. Wash us again in your blood. Cleanse our consciences. Let us not be alienated in our minds by wicked works. The works themselves, they are sin, but they are immediately dealt with when we confess. Yet the condemnation is really what keeps us out of your presence, God. And we must repent, but we must not grovel and stay in a place of condemnation. So if you're here tonight and you've committed sin, it says in 1 John 1, 5, if we confess our sins, 5 to 9, if, we can, if anyone says he has no sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It says in another place, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. I'm going to have the... Uh, prayer ministry team just come forward as well if some of you need to get right with God first then you go ahead and do that and then you start praying with others so if you're here tonight and you've got some unconfessed sin in your heart then please come forward and confess it we'll be confidential you just go ahead and confess it we don't even care because you know what God's going to forget it really fast and so will we because he throws the sin as far as the east is from the west into the sea of forgetfulness and by the same token if you're here tonight and the enemy has been lying to you, saying that you are yet a sinner. You are not saved by grace, or that you are struggling, or that you can't make it. And he's bringing you to a place where you don't have boldness to come before God because of your sin. Then come forward and we will pray with you and break off all condemnation. Break off all accusation. But just make sure you're purposing in your heart to run 100% after him. Don't keep one foot in the world, says in his word, come apart and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Make up your mind tonight to be conscious of no lack. God has given you everything that you need for life and godliness. Everything that you need. Go ahead and come forward. Come on, tonight. Tonight, if you're wanting innocence restored, if you're wanting your innocence restored, the blood of Jesus is enough. The blood of Jesus is enough.